we have an essentially cannabis legalization, nationally speaking, as long as you fit in some really narrow guidelines, which isn't all that different from literally every state marijuana program in existence. You have legal marijuana as long as you fit within the guidelines of that regulatory program. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we've got a very special guest, Chris Font, CEO at High Spirits Beverage. Chris, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, so I appreciate the opportunity. As are we. Kellen, how are you doing? I'm doing really well. Really excited to talk to Chris. I mean, I think we're going to cover a ton of topics today. And it's just nice to have a West Coaster back on. You know what I mean? I think Chris is in Denver, so a lot of West Coast loyalty. How are you, Brian? Yes, yeah, yes, Kellen, you're right, uh, Chris. And if we had to have an allegiance to the East or West Coast, which one do you choose? Uh, West Coast. Yeah, there she is. All right. Yep. Well, I don't want to waste too much time on the West Coast. We got a lot there, so we got to get we got to get to some of these hemp topics today. So, Chris, uh, before we dive in, can you give a little background about yourself, and then how you kind of got into the cannabinoid space? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, God, good question. You know, I was in the legacy market when I was a teenager, and that was really me cutting my teeth into space, understanding the plan, understanding uh, use cases, people, their consumption profiles, etc. I kind of looked at it more like a business than a hobby, even at you know fifteen. But I had a a child young at 21 and uh, realized at the time, I'm old enough that this was at a time when you'd still go to jail for a very long time. And you could still do that in a lot of states, still go to jail for this stuff. So I'm not I'm not ignorant to that. But I I, I grew up where there was nowhere legal. Um, It was all highly illegal. And after having a kid at 21, decided, you know, I really am passionate about this plant, but not passionate enough to make my kid grow up without a father. So I'm going to bounce out of this. And uh, ended up pursuing a career in programming. I've uh, been programming since I was like eight years old, really ahead of the curve on that, and uh, made a lucrative career out of it that led me into general business operations, strategy, entrepreneurship sort of roles. Um, launched a couple companies with minimal success, had a software agency that I was running for a little bit. And uh, one of my clients had been uh, entered into the hemp space. And this is 2018 pre Farm Bill. And uh, essentially they said, look, Buying CBD isolate is like rolling the dice right now. It's Russian roulette. You might get a truckload of powdered sugar or you might get what you bought or it might be loaded with hexane and other crap in it we don't want. And so people are getting screwed left and right. We want to create a marketplace where you purchase a product. That product shows up because the marketplace is guaranteeing the product. And uh, as my agency was going through discovery with this group, um, we determined that they didn't actually want to run the company and they hadn't thought through the software well enough to have a full business model. And one thing led to the next and I ended up running that company and building it sort of from scratch. I got really excited about the opportunity to enter cannabis, even though it was through industrial hemp more or less at the time and CBD and got to really understand the space. In 2018, that farm bill was signed in December and we, you know, reading drafts of it coming up, we wanted to make sure the marketplace was uh, in compliance with the farm bill. So we had to have a pretty robust regulatory and legislative understanding. We wanted to make sure if you're in Florida and you're selling crude and someone in Colorado wants to buy it, what licenses do those states require for that transaction to happen? And can you even do that legally? And in doing that, we had to deep dive and really understand what we were talking about. And through that, it gave me an opportunity to understand the industry from a legislative standpoint, unlike few in the space at the time. So I right away recognized the 0.3% Delta 9 advantage and did some quick napkin math and said, holy shit, you can make edibles with THC from hemp. But my business model that I was responsible for had nothing to do with CPG at the time. And no one was getting high off of hemp at the time. And I didn't want to be the first guy to do that, though I saw the opportunity early on. Well, fast forward through a couple pivots, you know, no one, no one jumps into the cannabis space and the first job they get is the one they have 15 years later. It's just not how it works in our environment. Um, so fast forward to a couple pivots later and we're selling um, curated type three cannabis for inhalation. And we were running a marketplace. We brand the farm. So, you know, where you got it from. We did our own COAs. We made sure it had good bag appeal. It was cured properly like cannabis should be. It was just high CBD, low THC. Well, while I was running this company, Project Hemp Flower, uh, customers in, started hitting us up for Delta 8 and Delta 8 sprayed flower. 
Now I knew about Delta eight already um, being connected to all the labs in the country. Like I was through the marketplace. I understood that Delta eight was coming on the scene and had talked to some of my chemist friends and decided this isn't for me. Um, no one's consumed Delta eight in any tangible quantities of significance. Like we have Delta nine. Um, there's a bunch of impurities in the conversion process that are ending up in the product. I don't know if the this conversion process is going to be deemed legal in the future. It just seemed too risky and too unknown at the time. So we decided not to purchase or resell any sprayed Delta 8 flower. But I was like, well, the getting high from hemp cat is out of the bag now with Delta 8. Maybe it's time to talk about Delta 9. So I went and finally secured a legal opinion and had a friend of mine that was a gummy manufacturer do a test run of some full spectrum distillate 10 milligram THC Delta 9 gummies. They tested fine. The consistency was okay. A little little hempy full spectrum of 10 megs. That's a little hempy for a gummy. Um, but it worked. And I was like, shit. This is a thing. So then I talked to the USPS and said, hey, can I mail this? Or am I going to get in any trouble? And they looked it over and said, nope, you're at 0.2%. This is a full spectrum product. You can mail this all day. We'll add you to our whitelist so you don't get seized. And I'm like, shit, I can mail edibles. So uh, we did that. We launched a company called Trojan Horse Cannabis. We were the first intentionally uh, Delta 9 hemp product on the market. And uh, through that, really start to see this you know, you've probably talked about, in fact, you have talked about it on your podcast before, like the red versus blue states uh, legalization uh, strategy and sort of kick that off in a big way and help the industry understand it. Like we we plowed the fields. We went and taught other companies how to do it, explained to distributors how it works, literally had competitors call me and say, tell me how you're doing this so I can do it. And I was like, okay. And instead of keeping it a secret, actually got the information out there. And retroactively, now that you look back, the 0.3% is not rocket science, right? It's not, once you get it, you're like, how did anyone not understand this before? But it was a really heavy lift to get people's brains to wrap their head around this concept initially. Can you explain that? So for, for anyone who's hearing that, who's just unfamiliar with that, can you explain that and just kind of let them understand yeah. the differences? Yeah, absolutely. So in 2018, the Farm Bill uh, was signed into law, which included the Hemp Act of 2018. The Hemp Act did two primary things that, that's uh, relevant to this conversation. Number one, it created a new definition called hemp. Hemp is just a legal definition. It's not botanical. It's not scientific in any way. It's a legal term. They could have called it clown weed and it would have been fine because it doesn't matter. It has no relevance other than the legislation. Well, the definition of hemp is just cannabis that happens to be 0.3% Delta 9 by dry weight or less. I.e., if you have less than 0.3% THC in this particular cannabis plant, it's no longer called marijuana, it's called hemp. Number two, they changed the Controlled Substances Act under the definition of marijuana to say, cannabis sativa L and all of its derivatives, yada, 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 is all completely illegal, Schedule 1, except for hemp as defined in uh, the Agricultural Marketing Act of 1946, which is where that piece of legislation went. So they essentially said these types of cannabis plants with this little amount of THC are no longer controlled substances, not schedule three, not schedule four, not pharmaceutical only, just not on the schedule anymore, period. Uh, that's it. That's, that's the concept is that the THC from this plant is essentially legal. It's, Delta 9 THC, not THCA, correct? Actually, THCA is also legal from the Farm Bill. Specifically, the definition very clearly says the level of Delta 9 is the differentiator between hemp and marijuana, period. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if it's the acid or the neutral form? Correct. It's it's The acid is not counted. And just to, just to add one more level, the difference between THC and THCA for those who are unfamiliar? Yes. Yeah, so THCA is what the plant actually makes. It's delta nine THCA. The A is acid. It's a it's a carboxyl like group that's that's tied to the molecule or the compound. Um, THCA converts to delta nine through a process called decarboxylation. Most people do this unintentional or not unintentionally, but not knowing they're doing it when you light your joint. When you put that flame to your bowl or to your joint or to your dab or whatever you're doing. Uh, that heat changes the THCA in your product to Delta-9 on the fly, so you're inhaling Delta-9. THCA has no impairing effects. You could take a 30% THCA flower. If it's got no Delta-9 in it, you could eat three pounds of it and feel nothing. It will have no impact on you. Uh, aside from some medical benefits, which we could talk about a whole separate topic, but uh, no impairing effects of psychoactivity. Um, Delta-9, the plant does not make. 
it degrades from THCA through either heat or oxidization, time, these sorts of things. And so Delta-9 inherently is very low in the plant, even in the high THCA varietals you see in dispensaries. Like your 30, 30%, which I questioned to begin with, um, let's say 25% THC flour is probably really like 25% THCA and 1% Delta-9, right? And so that's, that's how that works. Now, THCA was not part of the definition of hemp. Therefore, it doesn't matter if you're just looking at, I possess something today, not how it got here, not how it was made, not what licensing structure. I have a product in my hand. I'm going to get arrested for it. Will a court of law prove this to be hemp or marijuana? The only distinction is the Delta 9 level. Now, we can get into gas chromatography and other things here, yeah. THC, but Delta 9 is the only metric that matters. THC and that was, they, the reason they did that was to protect the farmers, correct? Yes. Because it's just inherent that when you grow hemp, you'll have a little bit of these compounds present. Yes. it's yeah. uh, Until recently, there hasn't been any varietals that have actually 0% THC. It's It's been impossible. There's some there's some genetics out there now that have been bioengineered to, to completely knock out that latent delta, uh, THCA expression. You know, THCA is converted uh, down the chain through, you know, CBGA is the mother molecule. That creates all the different things, CBDA, CBCA, you know, all those different A's. Um, THC is created from CBGA as well. Well, there's a primary metabolic pathway that creates the majority of CBGA into THCA. Essentially, in other cultivars, they've said, hey, we're going to knock that chromosome out so it doesn't have the knowledge of how to make CBGA into THCA. But you still get it, and you get it from not a primary metabolic pathway, but latent and secondary metabolic pathways, sort of like a byproduct of other processes. They've now figured out how to make varietals that don't do that either. I don't know what quality these, these genetics are. I haven't seen any plants myself or any COAs, but I've read a lot about it. Now, THC comes into play because of total THC and the USDA rule. People forget that when the, this rule was implemented, when the legislation was implemented, in the law, it directed USDA to build a cultivation program. USDA, you're in charge of the farmer. You're in charge of the plant until it gets chopped down. You need to create some sort of program, licensing structure, grading, these sorts of things for this plant so it's an agricultural commodity like it should be. In those directions to USDA, there's one term that fucked everything up. Oh, sorry. I don't know if we can swear on this podcast. My mom, my you mom can say anything you want. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> but fucked everything up pretty good. And essentially, it said the USDA must create testing methods that use post-decarboxylation or other similarly reliable methods. Now, for a long time, THCA was not being discussed in the hemp space. And we've gone so long away from it that people forget this. And they're like, but, but total THC is a thing. Yes, but that wasn't invented until the final rule came out quite a bit of time after uh, legislation was approved. And essentially, USDA took that post-decarboxylation word and interpreted it to mean we have to decarb the product, then we have to be under 0.3 Delta 9. Well, that's a regulatory interpretation and not law. From legislative perspective, you can easily say another similarly reliable method to determine the Delta 9 percentage is HPLC, which actually separates THCA from Delta 9. Whereas combining it all together, is not exactly what the intent was. Now, we can talk about congressional intent, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what they intended to do. It matters what the law says. And in absence of, or when there's clear language, intention's irrelevant. Intention only really matters when it's totally ambiguous and confusing. So people think THCA matters on a finished good because USDA implemented total THC. But what they fail to understand is the USDA only manages the plant and as soon as it's cut down, the USDA says, we're not in charge of this anymore. Anything we say beyond the plant being chopped is irrelevant. And it's a big thing that a lot of folks don't understand. On that note, they think that this is going to be fixed in the next farm bill, right? They're going to change the, the definition of hemp to say post-decarboxylation or total THC and make that definition. I would be absolutely shocked if this happened. And this isn't just like my opinion of what I think should happen or reading the tea leaves. I'm heavily involved in multiple trade associations, um, and I've actually been requested through a trade association to write a bill for the USDA for the next farm bill for House Ag. And we've heard from multiple people, not just myself, people telling me, 
But those people telling other people who then get back to me and confirm what I heard, that the definition is not going to get touched in this farm bill, not with a 10 foot pole. We're we're talking about insurrection. We're talking about all these other things. We're talking about, you know, government uh, corruption and we're trying to get the federal funding passed so the government doesn't shut down. We're going through House speakers uh, like it's a hot pocket, like you just get a new one every day now. They're not super focused on touching hemp. And what they don't want to do is make anything worse or more complicated than it already is. And since they don't have the energy to say, hey, let's all really understand hemp and the hemp space and cannabis and where this is all going so we can make some smart choices. They're like, I've got an idea. Let's not fucking touch this at all. So it doesn't get any worse. It may not get better, but it won't get worse. And uh, we're not prepared to handle the consequences of those changes. So I would be shocked if there was a definition change in the farm bill because they're all saying it's not going to happen. Um, and on top of that, I don't think we're going to get a farm bill this year. It's probably going to happen late next year at the earliest is my assumption. And uh, so we're going to be in the situation we're in for a while still. Uh, FDA is not going to step in. DEA has no ability to step in. TTB would be a great option, but unless they're told legislative to, they're not going to touch it with a 10 foot pole. So for all those people that don't understand, total THC is a number for the plant, not on the finished good. There's no number for the finished good other than 0.3% delta nine, which is also arguably not accurate, but I could talk about that academically and in practice doesn't matter because everyone's going by the 0.3, but we have an essentially cannabis legalization nationally speaking, as long as you fit in some really narrow guidelines which isn't all that different from literally every state marijuana program in existence. You have legal marijuana as long as you fit within the guidelines of that regulatory program. So how is adult use in Kentucky? Because it has to be 0.3%, but you're still getting your 10 milligram edible. How is that any different than adult use in Colorado where you have to go to a dispensary to get it? Because the plant percentage is different that it came from. Like, I don't understand how people consider this not a legal pathway um, or good progress for cannabis in general. What is uh, the Human Health Services ruling about suggesting for rescheduling? Does that impact any of this at all? So, yes, um, but not in the ways I think most people think it does. I have a very interesting perspective on this. One, I am generally anti-Schedule 3. Uh, okay. This recommendation, I think, is bad for industry. And I think Could you it's elaborate? a case of... What's that? Could you just expand on why you think it's bad? Yeah. So I think it's a case of let me hang something shiny in front of you that makes you think it's really good. And the good thing is once you go off of so schedule one or schedule two products are the requirement for the 280E tax provision. For those of I'm sure everyone of your listeners knows, but real short, if you sell a schedule one or schedule two, the IRS, uh, the code 280E says you're not allowed to deduct operating expenses, which means as a business, you can only deduct your cost of goods. Everything else is taxable. So you could be put in a situation where you owe more tax than you made profit. It's a really difficult spot to navigate as a company, damn near impossible, actually, and it's crippling the industry. So people think, oh, when this goes to Schedule 3, I won't be subject to 280E anymore, and now we can operate like a real business. That's true, sort of. But here's why I think it's a problem. Schedule 3 requires a prescription. This is a pharmaceutical product. You can't literally name a Schedule 3 product that isn't mandated by pharmaceutical companies and ran through that channel and sold at pharmacies. It doesn't exist. Now, to date, Big Pharma has stayed clear of messing with uh, marijuana in general, other than some synthetics like Marinol, Epidiolex, things of this nature with cannabis. But it's Schedule 1, which means even pharma has to play some significant smoke and mirrors to get a product to market that is some synthetic version of a cannabinoid. When it goes schedule three, it's going to be a lot easier for them. For It's going to be a lot easier to research, which people really discount the impact of schedule one research and the fact that you pretty much have to do it outside of the country than import something into this country. If you're already here, schedule one is really difficult to operate in. If it's schedule three, well, that shit. That's what they do all day long. That's no big deal. This fits in their SOP. But now, research, research is good. For all, right? Consumers also. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Research is good for everybody. 
Um, but it does open up pharma to also be able to research easier, which that research generally is good for the population, but it really benefits financially the entity that's doing the research because they get the patent, they can run the product, and they can sue other people that try to make it. Now, you have the multi-compound versus singular compound problem, which is an FDA pharma problem, which we could probably be on the scope of this call. But the reality is I think they'll figure that out. I think they'll figure that part out and they've got the money to figure it out. And what happens, you know, everyone says they're not going to come after state programs. It's schedule one and no one's coming after state programs. Well, right, because what does pharma have to gain by coming after state programs? They, they can't engage in the space right now anyway. As soon as they can, now they have financial reason to engage in the space and get protective. So my fear is that what's going to happen is schedule three lands. 280E opens up and everyone goes, oh my God, this is the best thing that ever happened to cannabis. They start growing. The industries grow bigger. In the next three years time, pharma is working in the background to thread the needle on how they can get a product to market underneath this category. Once they understand it, they do a couple of acquisitions. Who are they going to acquire? The biggest people in the space with the largest target market, no matter how much money they're making, because they've got the most exposure to the most people and they've got the most research product development behind them, et cetera. They'll buy those people up. And as soon as they have financial stake and can show damages, now it's a RICO class action lawsuit against every state allowing Schedule 3 to be sold without following the proper guidelines. And what is a federal judge going to do? What would the Supreme Court rule if you said, hey, I'm creating a Schedule 3 product and I'm following regulations. These other people are not following regulations and the state's protecting them. I'm suing the states. How is a federal judge going to rule? Are they going to say, yeah, but we really like marijuana and don't want to hurt the states. They're going to rule exactly as the law states, not as the law should be. And they're going to win. Pharma's going to win that. And when they do, you're going to start seeing states shutting down their programs and it's all going to be owned by pharma. I think we could take that entire conversation and that could be the focus for the next 45 minutes. But I really want to focus <laughs> still on the hemp because I think yes. what you alluded oh, yes, to yes. before is is basically that the regulators, they opened up the cannabis industry and most people in general didn't even recognize that the floodgates have essentially opened. So Correct. just to clarify, people now today can order products online that can get shipped to their house like beverages and can consume those beverages and can ultimately get high from consuming those beverages. Correct. And to tie in real quick, I won't go on the schedule three thing much longer, but the reason I was giving all that background is hemp is not marijuana. It's right. literally excluded from the CSA, which means if marijuana goes schedule three, Unless there's legislative change to re-put hemp into the classification of marijuana, hemp is not Schedule 3. So all of a sudden, you have this pharma marijuana doing this, and hemp is like, cool, you still want to get high through the mail? We can still do that. Hemp will become the national adult use recreational market because it's accessible without going through pharma, and it's clear of pharma's talons, if you will. So, yes, it's legal now. Uh, it's unregulated, which is not good for consumers and it's not good for business. Um, we need regulations, but it's legal. It's not criminal uh, to possess these products. And some states have tried to make it criminal. Some states have had their asses handed to them by trying to make it criminal. Other states are winning that war, so to speak. And I do ultimately believe that the state should have the right to say, you can and can't do this in our state. Um, but I think it's time we get off of this uh, cannabis the uh, terrifying devil's lettuce stigma and tell states to show it up their ass because it's, you know, this is not hurting anyone uh, like they think it is. That narrative needs to die. But hemp is accessible now. Uh, we essentially have a version, at least of ingestibles. We could talk about inhalables separately, but at least ingestibles is pretty black and white. And we need regulations to get these products safe, but it's available now. And any stopping of that is really short sighted saying, hey, I can get edibles through the mail. I want to make that illegal why? Why are we doing this? So you can protect your market. I was at a uh, conference by a cannabis association in Washington state. It was, a, it was a marijuana trade association. Everyone in the room was a marijuana operator. We had legislators and regulators on, on panels and I was on a panel and I was basically invited to say, you're a hemp guy. Come sit on this panel so we can roast you and you can prove why hemp should exist in a room full of marijuana operators. And I was like, okay, that sounds like fun. So I showed up to this meeting and a lot of the questions I was getting had to involve, it's already hard enough to exist as a marijuana company, but now we're fighting online mail order. How is that fair? And I said, let me ask you guys a question. In general, 
do you support interstate commerce of marijuana? And everyone said, yes, of course we do. And I said, cool. How are you going to protect against interstate commerce of marijuana if you can't protect against hemp? It's the same problem under a different name. What are you going to do when people can buy marijuana online and it shipped to them? If we all say that's what we want, and if we all say we want marijuana truly normalized, true normalization means on my way home, I stopped to get some gas and I picked up a thing of edibles from the gas station along with my Cheetos and a beer, and now I'm headed home. That's do, normalization. Does Do hemp companies and let's call them cannabis companies operate by the same rules and regulations from financial ads? 280E, state licensing fees, are all those the same or are they are those different? Completely different. Completely different. Very few states have made any sort of uniformity here. Do you think that's fair? Because maybe that's, well, I'm, I'm not defending them. I'm just wondering if maybe from a financial aspect that they pay 280E, they've got all these licensing fees, they got to do those regulators. If ultimately both parties operated on the same like bucket, maybe that would be why they'd be like, hey, now this is fair. Thoughts on that? So one, your the basis of your statement is totally true. It's not fair, um, and and I don't think that uh, marijuana companies should be regulated as hard as they are. They should be more regulated in some ways and way less regulated in other ways in order to be successful. But while I say it's not fair, I say that tongue in cheek because no one is restricting a marijuana company from opening a hemp company. It's not restrictive to do so. It's very restrictive to get into the marijuana space. Right. If you want to go participate in the Washington market or the Oregon market or the Nevada market, you have to have a lot of financial backing. Um, I run a hemp company that's reasonably successful and I'm a social equity approved applicant. I've got my approved application in the state of Colorado. I still cannot afford to open a marijuana company here and nor would I because they're all going out of business and no one's making money. So to say it's not fair is to say, well, if it's only not fair if you concede that you have to stay in marijuana and you can't move to hemp, but there's no restrictions on moving to hemp. And we're seeing more and more uh, consumer packaged goods companies do this. Cookies, Kiva, Keef Cola, Can. I mean, they're starting to realize like, oh my God, I can ship edibles through the mail. I'm an idiot if I don't do this. It's an economics thing too. Like there's no uh, canopy limits on hemp. Like someone can grow 5,000 acres of hemp farm it with a tractor, convert it, and all of a sudden at the end of the day, the finished product or the raw ingredient that you're putting into those edibles is drastically cheaper than the same product you're looking at from a marijuana yeah. operator. And so just from a straight economic standpoint, there's just no shot in terms of, of competing. And so like, like you said, it is simple for them to go open up a hemp farm and just start this process of a business as well. They already have a lot of the skill sets. Yeah. What do you, why don't you think there's more push for that right now? It, because there's this weird, there's two things. One, sunken cost fallacy is very heavy in the marijuana space. Oh, yeah. Very heavy. And for those that don't understand it, it means I've already paid X amount into this. I can't abandon it now. Yeah. But that's false thinking because it doesn't matter what you've done to get where you're at. It's where are you going to go? Which to, If you have three paths to choose from, which one's the best outcome? It doesn't matter where you've been. What matters yeah. where you're going. Um, and two, there's this weird like pride or e ego about it, about like we're doing things the right way as if what are like who objectively can look at any marijuana regulations and say this is the right way to do marijuana. Nope. They all suck. And they'll want out of one side of their mouth to say we're doing it the right way. And out of the other side, they'll say our regulations are unsustainable and we're all going to go out of business. I'm like, how is that the right way? None of this makes sense to me, but it is. It's a stigma and it's a sunken cost fallacy. And it's just taking time that eventually through enough pain, those things erode and you get to the point where you're like, I'm going to go out of business if I don't do something different. I have to do something different. Then the option opens up and you start thinking, why was I so resistant to this in the first place? So 100% in degree and sunk cost fallacy likely is probably a very real thought process. And I would imagine that these big tier one MSOs who have sunk just an enormous amount of capital is very unsettling with what's going on in the hemp industry in your opinion though if truly if cure leave cresco gti all these big boys to turn into one was like you know what we're turning from cannabis to hemp would that influence your perspective on let's say how the the world should collide in the future or do you still think that'd be fair game and teach their own i mean to each their own it's their option to choose and they're choosing not to 
I think they're dumb for not choosing to engage in the hemp space. I don't want them to because I don't like their influence and how they run cannabis. But my personal desire for them not to be in the space doesn't mean that it's a bad move for them. I think it's a really good move. And if they were smart and if their investors were savvy, they would be moving that direction. So just to expand on that, because I want to get one more perspective. I listened to a podcast with Boris Jordan who talked about the fact that the biggest challenge for him to to go forward with this, and I don't want to miss any of his words, so if I do, I apologize, was the ingredient natural versus synthetic and being able to secure the products. Can you elaborate on those differences and if you think that that might be a cause for why some of these tier one companies are hesitant to to go into the space? I think it's a false narrative, actually. I don't think the synthetic thing really bothers them. I think they use it as a argument piece to win their side of the debate, but it doesn't really matter and I'll tell you why. Can you buy CBN products in the marijuana dispensaries today? Yeah. And if so, where do you think they're getting that CBN from? Converting it's it all synthetic. CBD. Yeah. It's all synthetic. And how about CBC? CBC is becoming a very new popular cannabinoid that you're seeing in dispensaries as well. Where are they getting that from? All synthetic. Yeah. So to say synthesis is bad, we don't support it. Also, buy our brand new CBN, CBC, CBD, THC gummy. Well, bullshit. Half of those ingredients are synthetic as well. So let's not pretend you're not doing it. Furthermore, the marijuana regulatory systems in any state that I'm aware of does not have SOPs or standards for conversions. So to say your conversions are unregulated, be like, cool, yours are too. What's the point you're trying to make? So I think it's a false narrative, but it is the narrative that they're saying. And I think that some people in the marijuana space are hearing this narrative from the trade associations and from the bigger MSOs. And they do believe it because they don't quite understand where they're getting their CBN or CBC from either. So I think that's part of the problem. But the other component here is it doesn't have to be synthetic. It absolutely can be natural. We've used, as the first company to do this, we've used natural D9, and we've only ever used natural D9. Now, I'm not ripping on people that don't, but for me, I'm more comfortable extracting something from the plant the same way it's been done for how many hundreds of years, and then putting that into a product where we know humans have been consuming this thing for a long, long, long time. It's not a version or like what someone's been consuming. It's what they have been consuming. And so I'm personally more comfortable in it. And if a marijuana company was really serious about saying, I don't want to touch synthetics, then don't. Buy natural D9. It's more expensive. It's a little bit harder, but it's not impossible. And people will say, well, the market doesn't have enough biomass to support natural D9. Well, right. That's how supply and demand works. When more people start wanting to buy it, the price will initially go up, but that will force farmers into planting more biomass because now they have a channel for it. Um, It's totally feasible to get this off the ground. In fact, I'm going to blow some minds here and say all distillate that is consumed in 10 years from now will come from hemp, all of it. And here's why. You can have a grain crop that produces more THC by acre than a high THC type one cannabis plant. And why? Because you're stacking them right on top of each other. And just by sheer quantity, you're getting more, even though the percentage is less, the volume is more. And if you're, you know, we do want grain as a crop that the U.S. produces. This is a, there's a huge push, but people even say the reason for the Hemp Act was for fiber and grain. So if we continue this to conclusion, where you've got big ag doing 100,000 acres of grain, they're already making their money off of the grain side. That's their business model. The THC they get from the biomass, literally, they would just throw it away otherwise. It's going to take one company that's doing 100,000 acres to say, why don't we just save this biomass and then build some extraction and distillation on site because we can afford to do that because we're big ag. And uh, we can start pumping out distillate for this market. Well, now you've got $100 liters of distillate because it's a byproduct. It's an afterthought of a much, much larger economy in big ag. If you think we're still going to be growing 25% THC and using trim to get distillate 10 years from now, you're very mistaken. You're very mistaken. And for that reason alone, we should be supporting hemp because it's going to be the future of all ingestibles. Um, You're going to still need your craft, right? No one wants to smoke a concentrate that was made from a 5% THC grain varietal. It's not going to have the turp profile. It's not going to have the flavonoids and the VSCs that people love. So it only works for distillate. But that craft, that's where I see dispensaries going to in the future is higher dosage and craft product, just like you go to a cigar store. Why do cigar stores exist if you can buy a cigar at 7-Eleven? Well, because there's higher quality, better stuff. And if you're a cigar aficionado, you're not going to buy one at 7-Eleven. 
You're going to go to a cigar shop. This is what dispensaries will be in the future, I think, is the high quality stuff that's properly curated for the enthusiast. You can get an edible at 7-Eleven, but if you want that live resin, full terpene infused, fast acting, high quality stuff, you're going to go to a consumer focused shop that is focused just on your niche and your product type. I completely agree with that evaluation of the industry. I mean, I think that all form factors besides high-end inhalables will be derived from hemp. It just makes so much sense from an economic standpoint. And if you look at like comparing apples to apples, I mean, you can, can't can plant 100,000 acres of cannabis right now or marijuana, right. right? You can do that with hemp tomorrow. And I mean, you look at a lot of these companies that are crystallizing CBD and a lot of these other products, the byproduct is the THCA and they're, they need to report it. They're paying inventory space in safes and all these areas to just store it because they're like, hey, DEA, we have a ton of Delta 9. Like, what do we do? You know what I mean? And yeah. so finding a channel is even more motivating because it's a waste product. It's taking up money from a storage perspective. Like, it just makes so much more sense for all form factors to be derived from Delta 9. And then you also get like the positive side of that is you get the fiber and the grain for building materials, right? For renewable textiles, right? Yeah. Like, this was the main motivating factor behind the initial hemp bill and all the pilot programs that started in the early 2010s, right? Yep. Absolutely. And I'm still passionate. You know, that side of the plant is going to eclipse the cannabinoid side by volume when it gets off the ground by yeah. an insane amount. It's not even, you could give everyone a hundred milligrams a day, every person in the U S hundred milligrams a day, and they're still not going to compare to the revenue generated from fiber. And so to think that, the byproducts of a industry that's a hundred times the size is somehow not going to be more cost effective uh, than growing, you know, five acres of highly curated flour. It's insanity. So yeah, high quality inhalables, there's always going to be room for that. And there's always going to be a market for that. But if you're a budget brand, you'd be silly to look at hemp right now as a problem because it's your future, whether you want it to be or not. A lot of markets also allow you to sell like hemp dried cannabinoids into your cannabis market, right? Oh, yeah. So I got a great example of this. Um, the Utah Medical Program uh, launched and had product on the market in ingestibles before they had flour grown. And people will go, well, that happens in a lot of markets. Yeah, except for the Utah market isn't the kind of market that says we're comfortable quietly importing product from California and pretending we're not. They're very conservative. So they didn't want to do that. So what did they do? They imported CBD from the hemp space and converted it. The entire medical program was converted Delta 9 for the first like two years of the program. And so everyone's like, You'll see it on Reddit. They're like, oh, I don't buy that cheap hemp bullshit. I get my stuff from from uh, such and such in Salt Lake City. I'm like, it's the same shit, bro. You're buying the same thing, but you're paying 10 times the price for it. That's You're getting bamboozled and no one realizes it. But yeah, a lot of programs do allow the import of hemp material, and they are synthesizing D9 from CBD in the marijuana program. And somehow that's okay, but doing it outside of the program is dangerous. I don't understand it. Marketing, baby. So I want to get your perspective on Minnesota, specifically on beverages, where are they found? And then what is the main ingredient in that? So if a consumer is consuming a THC beverage, like what should they expect? What are they consuming? And how to know what to look for when selecting a product? That's tricky because the reality is I don't think consumers have enough access to the right information to properly discern which product's good for them, which is really unfortunate. And the reason we need regulations is because you don't go check the COA of your vanilla extract. Like no one's doing that. You go buy some product at GNC to help you bulk up or cut down. No one's looking for COAs or batch records on those supplements that are all synthetic because we don't want to, right? No one wants to put that level of work in, nor if you're unregulated, are you releasing that information? So the Minnesota market, how do you determine what to purchase and what does that market look like? There's a lot, of, a lot to cover here. Um, one, the regulatory structure, I think, is exactly what other states should be adopting. You have higher milligram products in dispensaries, lower milligram products available to the public virtually anywhere you can purchase alcohol. That's how it should be, right? If you can take a serving, consume it, and even if it's a little too much for you, you have a bad time, you're not going to freak out and go to the hospital, that's the right dosage to keep publicly available. I'm not comfortable with saying that 1,000 milligrams per serving should be available at 7-Eleven. 
It's not probably a good choice, but those things should be available to adults and they should be available through dispensaries. Minnesota is threading this needle with hemp and marijuana being the high dose, low dose. When the industry consolidates, which I keep calling the great consolidation, it's going to happen at some point. We'll just have cannabis. We won't distinguish between hemp and marijuana anymore. Whenever that happens, you're still going to have high dose, low dose. And I think high dose, low dose, low dose should be available everywhere you can purchase alcohol and probably places you can and high dose should be relinquished to these specialty stores. Minnesota is doing a good job of plowing the fields in this regard. I think their caps are too low across the board. I think five milligrams per serving is too low for public. I think it should be 10. But I also think that 10 milligrams per serving is too low for dispensaries. I think it should be 100. People don't like to hear this yet because they think it's insane. But really, we should have 100 milligrams per serving, 1,000 milligrams per package in dispensaries as just adult use, right? Because what high frequency, high tolerance consumer is like $20 for a hundred megs. That sounds perfect to me. That's not, no, that's why the black market's still thriving is because the dosage in rec is not large enough. We got to fix that problem. You need higher dosages and dispensaries, 10 megs and a hundred megs, I think is perfect for a low dose. Public you think it's like an educational step that needs to happen? You think it's an experience step? It, obviously it seems like Minnesota's at the forefront from understanding how to, how to consolidate the two but then adjusting the regs to kind of fit your perspective. Do you think that's just a matter of them working it through and then people saying like, hey, this makes sense? How do you see that playing out? It's time, comfort, and stigma. Everyone says a thousand milligrams. Oh my God, people are going to die. No, still they're not going to die. It's still cannabis. No one's going to take a thousand milligrams in a container and die the next morning because they took it. It's just the fear factor. You tell a regulator right now, I want to open up a hundred milligram servings and they think, oh my God, kids are going to die. Like, those people that have that knee-jerk negative reaction to cannabis just need to not be involved anymore. And until those people aren't involved in decision-making anymore, we won't get there. This is an extreme example, but 50 years from now, when people grew up with cannabis being at 7-Eleven and it's just a normal thing, those people, when they get in a position to legislate, are not going to be scared of the 1,000-milligram container. They just won't. They'll be like, so what? Some people have high tolerances. Why do we care about this? We don't do this in alcohol. No one's like, oh, how much alcohol did you buy today? Oh, uh, you can't buy from here because it shows you already bought two pits of whiskey this week at another store. Like, it's fucking insane that we do this. And we all think that this is normal and expected. And the marijuana regulator sometimes or uh, industry sometimes pushes for this is the only safe way to do things. It blows my mind. We should treat the intoxicating, or I, I don't like intoxicating, but impairing effects of THC the same way as we do alcohol, because it's actually safer than alcohol. So the rules should be less restrictive, not more restrictive. And this big fear of the black market, how you get rid of the black market is making businesses succeed and giving them the ability to create products that the consumers want. It's that simple. When you say, hey, I'm going to make it hard for you to succeed, and you're not allowed to build products that work for your target demographic, how the fuck do we think that's going to work long term? It just won't. Yeah, there's so many levels of challenges, right? And exactly like you talked about, you've got like the fear base, we've got the unknowing, we've got the research that still needs to come. And as you continue to level these up, you just layer on the challenges for these poor businesses who are trying to navigate, right? Because I think that's yeah. the better way to understand it. It's not really follow, it's really navigate these landmines from a left and right standpoint and trying to have a successful business while educating a consumer who doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah, it's just like why, you know, consumers buy off THC percent in dispensaries. This yeah. is a horrible purchase decision. You're never going to get the best quality product by looking at the THC number, but it's that it's expensive. I want to get as high as possible for as cheap as possible. But they don't realize that you could get more impaired from a 12% THC flower than you can from a 25% depending on other factors, right? Terpenes, flavonoids, other minor cannabinoids, how it was cured, et cetera, all play into the effects. And because research has been suppressed so long, we don't have any good data I mean, we have some good data now, but it's really lacking in the consumer market. You know, back in the day, you got your flour from your plug and what they had was what you got. And you had no idea what the percentage was, but you could still tell, I like this flour better than that flour. Hey, I got this stuff from you last month. That was the best. Do you have any more of that? I think it'd be interesting to go back and look at some of those percentages and realize some of your favorite experiences that you got blasted from were not the highest THC of the bunch that you had. And it's just going to take time. And there's always going to be those people that are buying on THC percent. That's never going to go away. But I think the connoisseurs, the folks that are going to go to craft cannabis shops and purchase craft cannabis, eventually they'll understand. But it's going to take a long time for that education to saturate down.
do you think it could be done through regulations in terms of like removing the need for a hard number on a COA in a rec market and just saying like yes. if it tests within these certain percentages that it I just gets classified idea. in those different categories? Because like yeah. essentially that's like people don't drink moonshine, right? Like mm-hmm. it's not the thing. Everyone doesn't go to the liquor store and it's like, no, I bought this bottle of wine because it's 14% and all the others were 13.5. Like yeah. that's just not how it works. Yep. You know what I mean? So And alcohol is never really... It's not that you don't see the percentage on the bottle because you do, but it's never been the deciding factor for what to purchase. There's yeah. been other things. They're making good products that taste different, taste better. Arguably, some people think the effects off of this are different than the effects off of that for different types of alcohols, which I don't really believe in. But some people have that placebo and, and for them, it works that way. That's fine. Like like beer drunk and versus wine drunk, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that like, it's really the other components that are changing your experience, right? If you drink really sugary drinks like Red Bull and vodka all day, all night long, you're going to feel like shit the next day. But it's not because it was vodka. It's because of the Red Bull, right? It's the wings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Or the sheer amount of wings you you ate, right? Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, effects do are different between consumption products and cannabis very, very heavily. Um, I do think placebo plays a lot in that as well. And we could talk about the difference between indica and sativa and that. But how are like how are the regulators and how is like anti cannabis industry going to ever allow that? Because they use them being the opposing forces, use that THC percentage to try to articulate this is, quote unquote, how dangerous the product is. It's kind of how it feels for me. It's like they use that number to fear monger and say, listen, we can't have these type of THC. It's way too dangerous. Is that kind of how you see them using it also or something different? No, I see them using it exactly that same way. In fact, I can't remember the states. I'm going to feel like an idiot, but there is a state that just proposed like a ban on anything above 18% or something like that. This isn't saving anybody, right? All it's doing is limiting your gene pool of available cultivars that you can get creative with. Pushing Uh, everyone back to the black market. Yeah, pushing everyone back to the black market. (laughs) Exactly like they wanted. Yeah, I think what was proposed is a really good idea. Stop showing the percentage and start showing some sort of grading system like super low low medium high super high and you know super high is 25 to 30 percent high is 20 to 25 percent and also these numbers are bullshit anyway like you're getting a sample of how many plants and you think that this one sample is representative of literally any flower you pull out of that batch it's nonsense and any cultivator knows this to be nonsense but somehow it's still ultra important that you get that THC percentage on there, which really doesn't mean anything to your batch that you're actually getting. And regulators are like, oh, we have to do a recall because this was off by 2%. Yeah. And if you test it a different part of that batch, it'll be off by another 2% later. Like you're never going to thread this needle to where every P- it's not that type of science. It's a plant. Maybe if you use a different lab, though, maybe shop around. A good lab. shopping. <laughs> Yeah, lab shopping is a huge (laughs) problem right now. We're seeing uh, fraud all over the place in the regulated markets because it turns out if uh, you can convince someone to up the points on your THC percentage and uh, then you can market it that way, you're going to outsell your competitors, which is a huge problem. But the scale, though, the challenge with the scale, and I'm agreement, I like the scale concept, is that if a consumer who's new, who's fearful of getting, quote unquote, too high, right? That yeah. they're they're making that decision on that THC percentage. And if they find a product that is, let's call it low and they get too high, then they're either like a likely suing if if you're a bad person. Right. And you're saying, hey, like this was terrible. And because of that, I had a panic attack, I had to go to the hospital. How how do we then avoid that and find a system that allows someone who's new and a little fearful to find a product that suits them in their real bar? It's That's the challenge, I think, that we're going to have to come up with. So let me ask you this. How have we systemically prevented kids who are just turning of age from drinking too much and getting sick their first year of consumption you restrict age we send them to college you restrict age but aside from the age restriction eventually you hit an age where you're allowed to consume you make adult decisions you make adult decisions how many people eased into alcohol and only drank a little bit to find their dose no most people were idiots and drank way too much for too long and decided I don't want to feel like shit all the time. I need to back off my consumption. How how do we have to somehow fix this problem for cannabis? And we never solved it in alcohol. And that's been a hundred and plus years at this point that we've had access to this stuff legally or a hundred years or so. We haven't figured it out there. 
what makes people think we're going to figure it out in marijuana or cannabis and what makes people think we have to? That's what fears me about the THC percentage is that it, it's not a, it's not solving the problem that I think it's intended to articulate to users. And because of that, I think it's just kind of compounding that same problem. I agree. And that's why I think the ranges will help because it incentivizes you a little less to buy off percentage and it incentives you a little bit more to know, like, what category do I fit in? And now now that I'm in this category, now let me look at the terpene profile, the bag appeal, the miners, all the other things. Because it's true, you know, if some people can actually get high off type 3 cultivars. Type 3 cultivars are typically going to be less than 1% total THC, right? You can still get high off that. People are like, it's too little, you can't get high, there's too much CBD in that. Bullshit. You haven't smoked in 30 years and you go through an eighth and an evening of type three, you're going to be pretty high, actually. If that's where you land, great. But a lot of people are going to graduate out of that if they start consuming regularly to higher doses. And that's OK. So we need something to indicate where you fall on this spectrum so you can plan accordingly for yourself. Just like, you know, if I buy a Bud Light or a Mike's Hard Lemonade. Yeah, Mike's Hard Lemonade. These are two different things, and they are gonna. One's gonna impact me more than the other. We need to have some sort of system for that. But people are going to consume too much. They're gonna have a bad time, and they're gonna have to figure it out. The good news is you can't die like you can from alcohol poisoning, right? You're not gonna be sick the next day. If anything, maybe a little groggy, right? You could starve to death. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I love this topic. I could talk about this all day. <laughs> Kellen, you got one more? I mean, you won't black out from smoking too much cannabis. You know what I mean? I no, that's the most I mean, important thing. It's it's well, a health perspective, right? Like if you inherently hard, cannabis is healthier, in my opinion, right? I a hundred percent. If you take that 21-year-old mentality of now I can consume, all my buddies are doing it. I want to prove to everyone that I'm not weak. I'm gonna way over consume to show how cool I am tonight. You might have a bad time. You might get panic attacks. You might find yourself in a corner not wanting to talk to anyone. If you consume way too much, you may even get nauseous and throw up. That can happen. Yeah. What are you going to feel like tomorrow, though? Totally fine. Probably go to bed at like 10 p.m. You know, sleep. Yeah, you're going to crash early. <laughs> you're going to get a really good night's sleep. You're going to wake up and be like, God, my back feels awesome. Why does my back feel great? Why am right? I so hungry? And why am I so hungry? You feel good in the morning. Maybe tired. If you way over consume, you can kind of have that hangover the next day. We're just yeah. like, having a hard time getting started this morning. But it's not a hangover. It's like brain fog. It's like brain fog. Brain fog. Just a little bit of brain fog. That's the worst case scenario. A yeah. little bit of brain fog and kind of a freak out in the evening before. You can have a freak out on alcohol. Everyone's everyone's seen that person that drank too much and is crying and upset because they think nobody loves them or whatever their problem is. But then the next morning, guess what? They feel like shit then too. And the older yeah. you get, the longer that lasts. I don't drink much anymore. I'm not anti-alcohol per se, but if I drink even a couple of drinks, I have a hangover that lasts until dinner the next day. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at like worst case scenario, right? Like there's young teenagers and kids in their early twenties that completely ruin their whole life with alcohol, right? They drink too much blackout, get in vehicle. Next thing you know, they wake up in jail the next day and there's literally a couple vehicular homicides on their hands. So like, yeah, and I'm it's not wild how we even are comparing these two substances, in my opinion. Yeah, and I'm not supporting getting high and driving. I'm not saying- Of course not. Publicly, this is not something I think is good for the country. However, if you compare someone who's really high to really drunk behind a wheel, one of them is clearly safer than the other. By a large amount. Why? Yeah. Because when you're too high, 55 feels just a little too fast, right? Like, I don't know, man, this seems a little, I'm just, I'm going to do 45 just in case. Like you get less confident in your ability to drive fast and do crazy things. The higher you get, the more drunk you get, the more confidence you have and the less you're able to assess your ability to judge. Like, I know a guy when I was a teenager that whenever he got drunk, he wouldn't drive slower than 120 because Literally. he was convinced that the faster I go, the easier it is to stay in the lines. This was his whole philosophy. Is he a race car driver now? No, he's probably dead if I had to guess. Um, but uh, but no one does this on who's ever gotten really high and been like, you know what I want to do? Drive real fast and freak people out. No, you're like, hey, you want to go on a drive? And they're like, no. 
that seems like a lot of complication. There's buttons and shit. I'm not handling that right and now. And you can also go approach them and be like, hey, give me your keys. And they're, you're going to have probably a very normal discussion about that subject versus trying to take someone's keys from someone who's been drinking and completely intoxicated is a completely different ask. Oh, yeah. So I went to uh, so with my with my company, High Spirits, we do beverages. We went to a, a gentleman's club conference in Vegas to try to get THC beverages normalized in that scene as opposed to alcohol. And my pitch, which was very well received, was when people get drunk, they get obstinate, they get confident, they get handsy and they get aggressive. All of these things don't play out well in a adult club environment, right? You have a, 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 a person of interest that you want something from, and you may get a little aggressive with them. You may cross a line. And if security comes up and says, hey, you need to leave, you may get obstinate and oppositional with that security guard and say, hey, you want to fight about it? Turn it around. Now the person's too high. And the dancer says, hey, you're not supposed to put your hands there. They're going to go, oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting. But you're very going to be apologetic, not confident and, and ob obtuse about it. When security says, sir, you've got to go or ma'am, you've got to go. You're causing a scene. You're going to go, I'm really sorry. You're absolutely right. And you're going to see yourself out. Right. It's a whole different experience. And this applies to every not just gentlemen's clubs. But every situation where intoxication and standard daily activities take place, you're going to make better judgment calls. You're not going to get yourself in situations you shouldn't. And that's not to say that it's free from making stupid choices, but your stupid choices involving eating too many calories and maybe buying some shit off Amazon that you probably shouldn't have bought, right? Not getting in a car and killing someone usually. Again, not advocating for high driving, but the profile is a completely different profile than intoxication from alcohol. We're sitting at a stop sign and thinking it's a red light. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. Right. Like overly cautious to the point of maybe danger because you're going too slow on the freeway. You're not you're not obeying right of right of way because you're too nervous about it. But those are a lot easier to handle because things are moving slow. Right. You come up to a stop sign. Someone's sitting there at the stop sign thinking it's a red light and they're not moving. All that does is piss you off. You're going to honk a horn. They're not blowing through the stop sign with the confidence of a drunk person thinking I can make this. It's a, it's a whole different safety profile. Let's do a quick prediction. Chris, which states do you see following Minnesota's after the Great Consolidation? How do you see that playing out? Oh, after the Great Consolidation? Most states. Most states? What about before the Great Consolidation? Pre-consolidation, any state that has a properly regulated, even kind of regulated hemp program, and then gets adult use after the fact, those states will follow in Minnesota's footsteps because one industry already has a foothold and can defend itself against the other when it comes in. When you have mature markets like California, Nevada, Oregon, Washington, you've got a very large incumbent there that is very protected on their own assets and will fight hard against hemp because they don't want the intrusion. But the other way around, hemp companies never say, no, we don't want adult use marijuana in our state. That never happens. We never lobby against marijuana normalization. Marijuana always lobbies against hemp. And so when hemp comes first, marijuana will follow. You'll get a Minnesota every time. When marijuana comes first and then hemp tries to get a foothold, you're going to end up with a Colorado or an Oregon every single time. Kellen. I'm going to go with kind of the Bible Belt. I think a lot of those states down south have the exact situation that Chris just kind of pointed out going on, right? Like Tennessee, Alabama, yeah. Texas, even as well, right? A lot of these states have a robust hemp program that now is kind of playing into a lot of businesses were started trying to sell CBD. The fiber markets will much, much longer play. Now they're kind of figuring out, hey, we got to diversify, make money. There's this opportunity. They're going to get better. And I, I think that um, those are kind of the states that you'll see more of like a Minnesota roll out as far as the ability for adults to consume Delta 9 THC before kind of the great consolidation. What do you think, Brian? We're in agreement, but I, since the rules of the podcast means I have to take a different stance, I will. Um, I'm going to take the approach that someone in a different state with a mature market goes from a legal aspect and says, you know what? Farm bill says what the farm bill says. I'm going to take this approach. Come get me. And I think it becomes a cascading of more legal events, as we've seen here in cannabis. We really like those. And I think that is the big decider where we have to have some bigger conversations in D.C. where they're like, you know what? 
this is problem has gone on too long because all it takes is one. And then after that, kind of the domino fall. So if I had to, I would say New York seems like the perfect opportunity to challenge from a legal standpoint because we're not doing anything right right now. And uh, with the recent ruling of them just knocking everything down, it feels like it's pure chaos and seems like the perfect time for more chaos. Yes. So, so Chris, for our listeners, they want to get in touch. They want to buy some products from you. Where can they find you? Uh, TrojanHorseCannabis.com. Uh, we'll be launching a high spirits focused website shortly, but right now TrojanHorseCannabis.com has for all of our Trojan horse and high spirits products. Uh, if you want to follow me because you're in the industry and like what I have to say, I'm on LinkedIn, Chris Fonts or Fontes, F-O-N-T-E-S. Um, happy to spit stuff that pisses people off or makes them really excited on LinkedIn all the time. So follow me there as well. Awesome. Thanks for taking the time. This was a lot of fun. We'll link it up in the show notes. Thanks, Sounds Chris. great. Thanks, everyone.